Well, Thomas, I thought that the uh, session last night was uh, a brilliant start to this <coughs> historic event, this historic congress, uh, whose task it is in this year of Lenin, what better year, a task to, to create, to found a revolutionary communist party, namely a, a Bolshevik party on British soil. And for us, there's never been a more important task. It's taken years, I suppose, for us to get to this point. A critical point, uh, not only for us, but for the working class itself. Of course, uh, this is not a, a British event, far from it. Of course, we welcome wholeheartedly the involvement and the participation of our comrades from other sections. Uh, we admire, we look up to and share our experiences with. It's certainly a, a founding of, a, of a, a British section of a world international, whose name is going to be changed to the Revolutionary Communist International, uh, the World Party of the Socialist Revolution. Of course, uh, we are entering this endeavor with our eyes wide open. Uh, we know that in the past uh, there have been attempts to create uh, a revolutionary party, but it failed. <coughs> we go back to uh, 1883 in the formation of the SDF, the Social Democratic Federation of Henry Heinemann, who uh, was supposed to be in a, a Marxist organization, but it was wrecked by dogmatism and by sectarianism. After the magnificent victory of the Russian working class in 1917 in the appeal of the international, a British Communist Party was formed in 1920, which drew to itself uh, some of the cream of the working class. But unfortunately, that was betrayed and, and shipwrecked by Stalinism and the crimes of Stalinism. During the Second World War, in 1944, our forerunner, the creation of the original Revolutionary Communist Party by Ted Grant and others. Unfortunately, that too was sidelined insofar as it faced unfavorable objective conditions, but more importantly, the intrigues of the so-called leaders of the Fourth International, which ended, uh, ended up destroying that movement. Of course, Ted Grant, kept the flag flying, kept the, the flame of genuine Marxism alive in the most difficult period. And uh, it is thanks to Ted's work that we are here today. And that uh, it's the pioneers that we have to look at, the work that they have done, and, and the fact that we stand on their shoulders. And in a sense, uh, we are retying the knot of history, but on a higher level. We've come a full circle, as it were. But today, the objective situation is far more favorable for us, that the crisis of capitalism has returned with a vengeance. And of course, we've learned the lessons of the past. We stand, yes, on the shoulders of the giants of Marx, Engels, Lenin, Trotsky, you also learn about the uh, experiences of the working class over the last 100 years, which has enriched our understanding and our, of our theory. And our task in the, in the next period, obviously, is to build the party, but to studiously avoid the pitfalls of sectarianism and also of opportunism. The founding of the party, the founding of the RCP, will be a testing time for all of us, politically and organizationally. But this task cannot be put off any longer. 
And I would say that the situation is more favourable now and in the future for building such a party than probably any time back to the early 1920s. And it is the job of this Congress to help us prepare individually for the storms that lie ahead, for the revolutionary convulsions that lie ahead, for the British Revolution that lies ahead. Of course, as an aside, it should be mentioned that we didn't present the comrades with a very thick British Perspectives document this year, dealing with all the aspects. We felt it was far more productive to have a shorter thesis on the British Revolution because it would concentrate the minds of all the comrades on the fundamental questions, on the fundamental processes, and not get sidetracked on the secondary lines. Of course, this uh, thesis needs to be read in conjunction with other documents, and in particular with the International Manifesto, which should not simply be read, but also be studied by comrades. It is a vital weapon that we must use in the next period. Now, Trotsky defined a revolution in his monumental work, The History of the Russian Revolution. <coughs> revolution was the forcible entry, he said, of the masses onto the stage of history, onto the arena of history. And this occurs very rarely insofar as a revolution is created with all the fundamental contradictions inherent in society are burst through to the surface. And that consciousness catches up with the objective situation, not gradually, with, with a huge leap, with a great bang, if you like. A transformation takes place in the whole outlook of the working class. And of course, at that time, at that stage, if the Revolutionary Party is strong enough, it will put itself at the head of such a movement to carry it through to a logical conclusion, the seizure of power itself by the working class. Now, if that is our aim, then the question we have to ask today is, at what stage are we at in this revolutionary process? To what stage are we passing? Of course, it is extremely difficult to work out the tempo of events because so many factors involved. But what we are concerned with here is the general march of events, general process, where they are heading and how far they have developed. Of course, the starting point for us, as always, is the, is the world situation. And of course, capitalism on a world scale is, has reached an impasse, it's reached its limits, and uh, this was reflected clearly in the crisis of 2008, in which capitalism has not fully recovered from, and also the crisis of 2020, which is combined with the pandemic. Because what we are dealing with here, which we have to understand, if this is not a cyclical crisis, this is an organic crisis. There will always be a boom and slump in capitalism, as long as it, it, it lasts, until it's overthrown. It'll always be there. But what we are dealing with here is not the boom and slump cycle, although that can be important, but we are dealing with something far deeper, more serious, that is this organic, inherent crisis of the capitalist system, where the very workings of the capitalist system have now uh, reached its limits. And this has an enormous consequences for developments. As Marx himself explained in relation to historical materialism, the fundamental driving force of history is, is the development of the productive forces of industry, technique, and science. But he explained that as soon as a society is incapable of developing the productive forces in any meaningful way, 
then that end is a period of decline and crisis, and prepares the way for social revolution. And this is precisely the period that we are in, on a world scale. And therefore, as was explained last night, we have entered the most disturbed period in human history. There's shock after shock after shock taking place. We see the, uh, the wars in Europe, in Ukraine, in the Middle East and elsewhere, which have enormous repercussions on the capitalist system, including on the consciousness, as we know, of workers and of youth who have taken to the streets internationally. They're terrified now of a new Arab Spring uh, are taking place, a revolution, in other words, in the Middle East, because of the consequences of, this, of, of, of these actions. Of course, in Europe, as has also been explained, Europe is in a, in a process of decline because of the imposition by American imperialism of its demands they must cut trade with energy and so on or, or with uh, Russia. This is a big implication, particularly for Germany, but also elsewhere, resulting in prices rising, energy cost rising, in other words, a further attacks on the working class itself. And again, we have this, this world conflict of America and, and China, this developing trade war, which can have enormous um, consequences internationally. So at the present time, world capitalism is limping along, stumbling from one crisis to another. And that every attempt that they have made to restore the economic equilibrium has resulted in disequilibrium socially and politically. In other words, they're in a catch-22 situation. There's no way out as far as they're concerned. And added to this instability and crisis internationally, the ruling classes now are looking with um, trepidation at the election of Trump in November. He will be a bull in a china shop. He will make things a damn sight worse than they are. In fact, he's threatened immediately to impose 10% tariffs on all imports, 60% tariffs on Chinese goods. In other words, if you're looking at the trade war being stepped up. And we should recall that the, the depression of the 1930s was not called, caused by the Wall Street crash. It was caused by countries raising tariff barriers all around the world, which led to a collapse in world trade and, and the depression. That's the prospects that we face in the next period. Therefore, we have to understand that even now, that capitalism has, has edged towards a depression. That, that was the case in 2008. But the reason why they escaped it is because they took exceptional measures pumping in enormous amounts of money, of liquidity, as they called it, into the capital system to buy it up. In other words, they had to bail out the capitalist system in 2008, 2020. But they've reached the road in relation, into the road in relation to this, because the colossal amount of debt, corporate debt, public debt, personal debt, has, has been come up an absolute mounting on the backs of the European and world economies. And therefore, what they have done in effect, they've built, because it's unsustainable, they've built dynamite into the foundations of capitalism. And anything can set it off in a chain reaction with all the consequences that can have. That's why they're terrified of a new slump, because the consequences of a slump, the banks, who they said had been shored up after 2008, you know, we've learned the lessons, you know, we learned that of the, if they're repeating exactly the same mistakes, they're overstretched. Now the shadow bank, banking added to the mix, unregulated banking, which uh, if they go down, it means there'll be a contagion throughout the world. This is the, the fear that they, they have, a devastating fallout. But I thought one was the, one of the most interesting remarks that was made was by the chief economist of the International Monetary Fund, who said, if there's another slump, we will not be able to bail out the system because of the indebtedness that we've reached. 
In other words, they've boxed themselves into a corner. They've used up the ammunition they have. Of course, they'll, they'll try, I'm sure, to find a way out. But how difficult that will be. I've got here a, a quote from the Financial Times. Obviously, the Financial Times is the, is the organ of uh, finance capital. It's a bit like the internal bulletin of the ruling class. <laughs> because it tells the truth, yes, to the to big business. Not that the workers who never read it. But it, but it explains a few days ago. While the global economy is able to handle a transitory bump, it is already too fragile to handle a large new economic shock. Right, that's the Financial Times. It goes on. The larger cloud on the horizon was an increasingly gloomy prognosis for the outlook of global growth over the next decade. What lies behind the gloom, it says, is a mixture of weak productivity, a retrenchment in globalization, and its consequence, frequent bouts of geopolitical turmoil. But what they're getting at is, is, is deepening crisis of the capitalist system. Together, it says, like it concludes, this toxic combination will drag growth down to paltry levels, and in doing so, sow the seeds of popular discontent <laughs> with mainstream politics. In other words, revolutionary developments, radicalization. This is what the ruling class's perspective is. And it says in its final comments, the downward trajectory in the IMF's longer term growth for forecast looks like, I quote, Swiss ski slope. <laughs> now, I've never been to Switzerland, on my, let me ask on a ski slope, but I've seen pictures, it's very, very sharp. <laughs> it's not the Marxists, who, it's not the communists who say it, it's the bourgeois strategists of capital who are saying this. They have recognized the seriousness of what is to come. A devastating position, growth, no. Decline, decline, which means big cuts, obviously, in living standards everywhere. This is the idyllic background to Britain, of course, and British perspectives. Britain has been in decline for, what, over a hundred years. From a dominant world power, it's now being relegated to a secondary and even a third-rate power on a world scale. On the edge of Europe, the ruling class has presided over a collapse in its position and have turned the Brit Britain largely into a volunteer economy because they've, they've undermined British industry. More and more they rely on services and on the financial sector. In fact, quite a few areas of the British economy have been taken over by foreign capital, as you know, in relation to the steel industry. Tata Steel is owned by Indian capitalists. Uh, British steel is owned by Chinese capitalists. <laughs> You've got uh, yeah, British rail or even the uh, power generation is owned by French and, and Chinese capitalists. This gives you an indication of the weakness of British capitalism. In fact, one comment sort of made the point of it. It's a bit like a, a dominated country, like, you know, where a, a, a colonial aspects of the country. Well, wouldn't go that far, but it shows the decline. <coughs> Workshop of the world has collapsed in its position. And that has major consequences as far as the working class is concerned. The ruling class is more degenerate in Britain than ever before. It's more <coughs> parasitic than ever before. It's relying on finance and financial wizardry to make money. They don't want to make money through production. They want to make money through money, through speculation. And that's precisely why we have Britain as a basket case at the present time. In other words, it's in, in, a, in a real dire state compared to its competitors on all the different industries you would like to mention. Investment for capitalism is a lifeblood. Without investment, they cannot grow, they cannot compete. Do you know what the investment in Britain is? Over the last eight years, it amounts to 
4.6% growth over eight years. It's absolutely incredible. The it's completely collapsed, particularly since, since Brexit, of course. Productivity, which is a key indices of the development of the economy, is growing in Britain by a miserable 0.4%. Again, an indication of the collapse of the position of British capitalism. Real wages have collapsed. Growth has collapsed. In the last 18 months, you've had the lowest growth rates in Britain since at any time going back to the 1920s. <coughs> Even in the Great Depression, there was a greater growth rate than is the present time in Britain. Last week, the OECD said that this year, British capitalism is likely to grow by 0.4%. This is the reality of British capitalism in crisis. Of course, um, it's, uh, it's, it, it's, it's an impact on obviously the ruling class itself. Um, Trotsky once uh, made, made a, a comment that uh, in its heyday, British capitalism in the 19th century, the ruling class was very confident. And they were able to uh, look at things in terms of continents and centuries. But today, I mean, they can't look further than their own nose. They completely and utterly degenerate at this point in time. Uh, not only is the ruling class degenerated, but its political representatives, as was said last night, they are clowns, they are complete imbeciles when it comes to the interests of British capitalism. You get the, with the likes of Boris Johnson, you know, of Liz Truss, of Jacob's Reese Mob, although the Commons in Cardiff did a great job and chased him off. <laughs> Compared to the past, my God, I mean, even Lloyd George, no, uh, Trotsky said he was extremely cunning, but he was shrewd. You know what I mean? He, he knew how to deal with things. With these, these people, they make a, a bad situation worse because they're only interested in their own interests. And thereby, the interest of the long term, long -term uh, interest of British capitalism is put uh, asunder. That's why they're all big fans of Brexit, which was a disaster from the point of view of capitalism, of British, of British interests in cutting itself off from the European market. Of course, they, the bourgeois in Britain had lost control. First of all, they lost control over the Labour Party. They regained that. They lost control over the Tory party. They partially tried to hang on through Sunak and, and, and Hunt as a safe pair of hands, but that's gone nowhere. You know, it's not solved the problem at all. Still, the, the ruling, the, 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 the Tory party is still very much in the hands of these, these, these creatures. And, the, and if there's a view of if, when the Tory party are defeated at the next election, the Tory party will move further and further and further to the right and will be further out of the control of the ruling class. These elements will come to the fore. And therefore, that's the kind of reality. The, the Conservative Party was the most successful bourgeois party in Europe, maybe in the world. And now it's become a laughing stock. Again, a reflection of the crisis and degeneration of British capitalism. So uh, we've seen as a result of this decline, the massive attack on the working class in all aspects, living standards have collapsed, the health service, education, you name it, all the fronts, whether it's railways, whether it's roads, where it's got sewage, where water companies pumping sewage into, into, into rivers. The whole thing has gone rotten. And of course, uh, workers realize this situation. Life expectancy has fallen. You know, the quality of life has declined everywhere. This is an important impact on the psychology of ordinary workers. In fact, it was a quote given by a nurse, a former nurse last week in The Guardian, which said, and I quote, I feel a real sense of decline. I believe millions feel that, millions of people, uh, because that's their experience. In other words, the objective conditions of capitalism are creating conditions for revolution down the road. That's the whole point. And with this has come anger, bitterness, frustration and everything. Working life has become a, a misery. Young people have known, what do they know? All they've known is austerity 
and attacks. And therefore, that's why they open to communist and revolutionary ideas. It's the, it's the actual experience that they feel. For them, for there are many layers, capitalism is becoming more and more discredited. And that's what we have to understand. And with that, as I explained yesterday, the institutions propping up capitalism have become more and more discredited. Whether it's the police, whether it's the judiciary, whether it's parliament, whether it's the monarchy, all these are in crisis. In fact, what we have here is not a, a political crisis. It's a crisis of the regime, which is something even more qualitatively different. It's more, far more serious than anything that we have experienced. Of course, uh, we know that with the Tories in Meltdown, we saw the local elections. Uh, of course, the, the ruling class now has looked to Starmer to save the day. They want to send the working class now to the school of Starmer to be disciplined by him. And of course, uh, he's grooming, he's groomed himself for the position. He's a loyal agent of the ruling class. And therefore, he will do anything. He will carry out the dictates of the ruling class. As a consequence, we've, said, we've seen these dicks to all the promises he had in the past to be, in, in, and he's talking to the ruling class when he does this, of course. He's trying to lower expectations for what's going to come. Of course, uh, I mean, in the past, the right wing, uh, right wing Labour leaders, when they were fighting an election, used to make promises. Of course, when they got in power, they, they betrayed the promises. Skarma is getting his betrayal in now, before he's elected. But of course, this won't save him. Whatever he's doing, this. Yeah, and there's no great expectations for, for many people. They know what, what this disillusionment of the Labour Party. It was explained uh, the other day. You know, the, I think uh, su uh, uh, support for Labour, general support for Labour, has gone down to levels not seen since 2010. The, the satisfaction rate for Starmer is minus 31. The only reason why you're going to win is that the Tories are even worse. That's all. There's no il great illusions, yeah. If there are illusions, they'll be quickly uh, dissipated. But be, it's not going to be a great honeymoon period under these circumstances. And of course, uh, they've made it plain. There's no bailout for the working class. There's no bailout for the councils who are going bankrupt. 50 of them actually are going to go bankrupt in the next year, they reckon. And all that will affect the most poorer sections with the, with the cuts that they'll, they'll face. There's going to be increased anger and bitterness from the word go, and demands, yes, give us help, give us help, and they'll have no help whatsoever. He said there's no magic money, three, in a real cynical manner, and they talk about, oh, we'll have some growth, we'll grow the economy. What a joke, isn't it? How can you have growth with, with a, a dire capital system in crisis? The only way you can have growth is through investment. How are we going to get investment? Well, the only way you can do that is increase the rate of profit. And how are we going to do that? Well, you can de if you cut costs, cut wages. But if you cut wages, you cut the market. It's a catch-22 situation. There is not going to be any growth. They're going to be in a static or declining economy. And that is, is, is the reality of the austerity that comes with it. So that's what we are talking about in relation to, to a Starmer government. It will be the most unpopular government, probably in modern political times, even more hated than the Tories are at the present time. It's going to create enormous opposition from the working class. They're not going to stand by and see the living standards further cut to the bone. They're not going to stand by and tolerate from a Labour government cuts that they, that they, that they in other words, a continuation of the Tory government. We've said in, uh, 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 in the past that we've seen a reawakening of the working class after being dormant for 40 years in the strike wave of 18 months ago. And what a, a change that would in a, rap, in a radical, in a short piece of, piece of time. I mean, we had layers going on strike, despite all the anti-trade union legislation, they probably one of the worst in the world. They had to jump through hoops in order to go on strike, even against their leaderships as well. But it's a, it was incredible to see new layers of the working class or becoming the working class barristers, for God's sake, 
Of all others, nurses. The Royal College of Nursing. It's not even a trade union in the real sense of the word. Going on strike the first time for a hundred years. It's an indication of the grand swell that is there. And the potential that, that is there. And of course, this is going to be, uh, this, a, a struggle is going to be on the cards with the Labour government it's as, as well. All hell can <coughs> break loose under a Starmer government. The trade unions will be forced into opposition. The trade unions would like to have a cosy relationship with Starmer. You know, tea and biscuits number 10. But that's out of the question. Because what they like on one hand is not going to be what the workers all want. And they'll be demanding action. They'll be demanding a struggle to gain what is just for them against the attacks and against the austerity. So we're going to have this heated development of the class struggle. And where again, new fresh layers of workers will come into activity. Even non-union layers will come into activity. And they, under the, this impact, I mean, you can criticize reformism in, uh, in articles and so on, quite correctly. But the working class does not learn from that. They learn from experience. An ounce of experience is worth a ton of theory, as Lenin explained. And the experience of that Labour government will be a vicious, vicious lesson for workers of the limits on, on betrayal of reformism. And that's why they'll begin to draw, yes, radical and even revolutionary conclusions as far as that is concerned. Of course, uh, they'll be under pressure. The left trade union leaders, they'll start uh, making more radical speeches, that's for sure. But of course, even the most radical trade union leaders only go so far. We saw that with Mick Lynch, where he was, uh, yes, very, very popular, very, very radical, and, and stimulated the movement. But then, in relation to Star, he says, you know, that we need to grow up and vote Labour, you know? In other words, be realistic. That's what he's talking about. And that's the real essence of the trade union bureaucracy. You've got to be realistic. It's all very well talking about, but we've got to be real. And of course, what that means is you could have to accept, you know, the lot of capitalism. That's what they're getting at. They don't want to go any further than that. And that's why they act as a colossal break on the movement. They always have done and they always will. They, Trotsky said they are the most probably conservative layers in society, which is probably true. They, they, are, they, are, they want a quiet life. They don't want this, this disruption, which they'll be forced into, of course. And um, not only will you, you probably the Labour left will start squeaking as well <laughs> under these conditions and complaining and so on and so forth. But of course, uh, we know there's, there's more fight in a paper bag than there is <laughs> in the left reformers. And we've seen that by experience, not through theory. We've gone through the experience of the Corbyn years and where they explained and showed graphically their complete spinelessness in fighting the right wing when they had the opportunity. They got to clear the lot out without any bother at all. But they were afraid. They wanted to, you know, live up was a broad church. We all got to come together and so on. When they were being stabbed in the back and stabbed in the front. And yet they weren't prepared to move against the right wing at this time. In fact, they've learned nothing, I would say, from those years. They repeat the same mistakes, the same approach, the same policies. In fact, uh, I see that um, Corbyn now, and Corbyn, if he wanted to, he could have created another party, which would have been over hundreds of thousands if he had said, if he'd given the, the word that we were going to create a new party opposed to Starbucks and so on. He didn't want to do it. Didn't want to put a break from his old pals in the, in the left of the Labour Party. He was afraid to go down that road in reality. Because all it would open up. Instead, he creates a project. The Peace and Justice Project. It should be Peace and Justice in brackets under capitalism project. <laughs> because the, the five demands that he put forward is zero. Zero socialist content. They're all based on the idea of making capitalism nicer. That capitalism reform itself to be more nicer for the working class. But it's also a mealy-mouthed pacifism of, uh, you know, a look to the United Nations. So let's be, you know, let's all get around and be, be, be sensible. He's appealing to the imperialists, appealing to the cutthroats of the world, 
They change their ways and, and become the United like Christian Church. You know, they change the, uh, change the other, other cheek and therefore we all can get round together in a nice way. But it's not going to happen. I've got a quote here from him. I may as well give it. It's quite amusing. Last week at Corbyn in the press. We are guided by hope, not hate. Real security isn't destroying your neighbour. It's getting on with your neighbour. Well, tell that to the ruling class of America or Israel or any of the other of the gangsters. They are only interested in one thing, and that's their own power, privilege, and interests. That's what guides them, not some moralistic uh, drivel that, they, that the arguments that these people put forward. And it's the same everywhere with, from the left, from even Stop the War campaign, look, led by you know, uh, Labour lefts and uh, ex-sectarian, well, reformists, they are all reformists anyway. And uh, they're always all, you know, we, have, we must uh, uh, all come together and, and we're against uh, war and we're, we're all for peace and so on. And we're going to have demonstrations. And, of course, we're in favour of demonstrations. No problem with that. We're in favour of protests. But we're not in favour of sowing illusions in capitalism that these people do. They think that the, the imperialists should cease to be imperialists. That the, that the system itself should be changed into its opposite magically. They're because they've got no confidence in the working class. That's the whole point. The reason why they are weak, they have no alternative to capitalism. And no confidence in the ability of the workers to change society. But what we're about is to tell the workers the truth. Yes, we can explain patiently, but at the end of the day we must tell them the truth. Unlike the reformists, who don't they spread illusions in capitalism. That is the danger of these people. In other words, they derail the movement against capitalism and not lead a movement against capitalism. And that's why we must take them up quite sharply politically in order to explain the way forward for the advanced workers. Of course, this applies not simply to the, to the international questions of war and peace, but to the, as I said, the, the economy too. I mean, capitalism, well, they don't use the word capitalism. <laughs> They complain about neoliberal policies, bad policies, bad capitalist. There should be good capitalist policies, he rather <laughs> bad capitalist policies. That's the level to which they have sunk. And that's the, the basis on which they operate. That is, they accept the capitalist system and therefore adopt, in, in reality, Keynesian policies, Keynesianism, deficit finances. That's all they talk well, like we should borrow more, borrow more and spend more, as if it's a magic formula. The only problem is that capitalism is, is a system based on, on exploitation and on profitability, not simply markets. And that's why this the idea of Keynesianism, as with monetarism, which are head and, and tail of the same coin, offer nothing for the working class, except inflation or deflation, whichever you may want. And this incident in my notes. I read a piece by Andrew Murray. Andrew Murray was a leading member of the British Communist Party and he's still a writer for the uh, Morning Star. He left and joined Corbyn and became an advisor to Corbyn. And he wrote a piece saying we must learn the lessons of the Corbyn era. I thought that would be interesting. What's the lessons then? He basically said, no, Corbyn was right politically and his approach was correct. The problem was the working class didn't support Corbyn. <laughs> In other words, blame the working class, not the spinelessness of these lefts. And that's the kind of role of the figure of the Stalinists and so on, who try and cover up the tracks of the betrayal of these left reformists because they are left reformists themselves. As we've repeated many times, inherent in reformism is betrayal. Not because they are personally responsible, it's because they limit their whole actions to remaining within capitalism, which is in crisis. And therefore, every attempt at compromise, which is their, their basic line, means a compromise with capitalism and a defeat for the working class. This has always been their approach and attitude. Of course, um, what we have to understand uh, and base ourselves on, is not the whims of these leaders and so on, it's the objective crisis itself of the capitalist system, which is pushing capitalism to the brink. And we should explain also, as the bourgeois kind of say, it's not, uh, revolution is not created by revolutionaries. 
revolution is created by the contradictions of capitalism, which propels the workers in this direction. The revolutionaries try and put their head, themselves at the head of the movement in order to guarantee its success, that's all. In other words, as Marx explained, you know, that the red mole of revolution is bothering all the time under society, under capitalism, but will burst out at a certain point. Of course, we have a, an interest in finding and explaining at what stage are we at in this process. We can see the crisis in the ruling class, the splits are ruling out there, the volatility in, in the middle class, the uh, uh, lack of any faith in the bourgeois institutions, uh, the re-emergence of the working class. All these are symptoms of a pre-revolutionary crisis development in British society. We should be clear, I know sometimes we can overstep the mark and we can be a bit more, we, we, you know, we have to be careful in our appreciation of what is going on. This is not a pre-revolution situation at the moment. There are elements there, we are moving towards it. You know, we've got to be careful in our analysis. As Trotsky said, you know, be careful, don't confuse the first month of pregnancy with the ninth. But he also said, you know, we have to recognize when conception has actually begun. And clearly, it has begun in relation to these elements of a pre-revolution situation developing in British society at the present moment. And of course, we can see that events are moving far quicker than ever before. And this crisis in Scotland, again, is an illustration of how things change very quickly. Sharp and sudden changes in the situation from relative stability for a long period of time we see that Scotland's come and out, and the SNP have caught up with the anger that there's faced the bourgeois and other parties in the rest of, of Britain itself. So it, it shows the way in which things happen very quickly, not in a straight line. Nothing has ever happened in a straight line. And of course, that applies to the revolution. If you think that there's going to be an easy route to the British Revolution, you are mistaken. There's going to be lots of difficulties along the road. Why? Because we are not a mass organization. That's why. There's a lack of a subjective factor. As a consequence, it's going to take various routes. There's going to be setbacks, of course, with the leaders we've got. There will be setbacks, big setbacks. But every setback will prepare the ground for a new advance of the workers. That's the point about it. Until, obviously, the working class itself can take no more from the situation. It will be, therefore, a protracted crisis. It will not be short-lived. It's not going to be like Russia in 1917, within the space of nine months, the working class is in power. It's going to happen over a period of time, over years, as a matter of fact. More like the Spanish Revolution of 1931-1936, which developed over a period of time, and within that period, you had reactionary period, the two black years, 1933-34. But precisely the reaction prepared the way for the big movements of the working class in 35-36 and the election of the Popular Front government, which then set off a new stage in the revolution where the workers seized the factories in Catalonia. We had the, the fascist revolt of Franco and the civil war itself, uh, opened up a revolutionary civil war at that time. Shows how uh, these, this process is a bit more complicated and there's lots of twists and turns because of the situation. But a revolutionary party has to understand, navigate its way through this situation. A revolution only comes about when there's a complete and utter impasse in society, when there's a catastrophe facing the working class, the middle class, and they cannot rule, the old rulers cannot rule in the old way, and the working class cannot live in the old way. There's no way out. Under those circumstances, the working class will draw very, very radical and revolutionary conclusions. It means, in reality, that the working class loses confidence in its old traditional organizations, the Labour Party included. It means that the middle classes lose confidence in the bourgeoisie, and the bourgeoisie loses confidence in itself. That's when you have a crisis in the whole of society. And under that impact, the working class will move not in the traditional way, but in a revolutionary way, in an insurrectionary way, to solve its problems. 
And of course, at that time, if we are able to build a party sufficiently large, then we can play a decisive role under those conditions. No doubt our, uh, our enemies and so on will say, oh, don't be so ridiculous. Surely not Britain or countries. You know, conservative-minded workers, Britain, they will never have a revolution here. And that the argument has been on and on and on and on. Well, you can have a certain validity for a certain time. Trotsky once explained in the 30s were quite uh, stormy. He said that the religion of capitalist progress has never been deeper in Britain among certain layers. I will say now it, it's, it's finished. The religion of capitalist progress for many people has gone out the window. That is finished. It's a new period that we've entered. And that period has been prepared by the crisis of British capitalism. That's the whole point. And there's no solution to this. It's going to get a damn sight worse. And the working class, unfortunately, is going to suffer as a consequence. But we've seen that we look at things in a dialectical way. How things change into their opposites. That's the whole basis of dialectics. How stability becomes instability. And look at Britain. A very stable country in the past, very unstable now because of the deep crisis that is affecting <laughs> us. You know, as, as, as Alan said, very great. The Bible is a great, great, great book. <laughs> You're the first, the first should be last, the last should be first. Very dialectical. Britain needs to be up and, right, up and running. It's down the bottom of the pan now. And that, again, has major consequences as far <laughs> as we are concerned. And we don't, we don't make this up. You know, this is based on the facts and figures produced by the bourgeois themselves. We don't make it up. It's clear cut. And therefore, we have to bring out clear to the workers and the people who influence what the reality is on the ground. In that sense, the past cannot be any real guide to the future in Britain. Because the future is going to be one of calamity compared to the past. Revolutionary Convulsions will be on the order of the day. And, and obviously the ruling class will be incapable of preventing this. And if they have the buffoons they have at the present time, they're going to make it a damn sight worse. And therefore, this is the epoch that is opening up. A period of, of inevitable revolutionary developments in Britain and elsewhere. This is the perspective. Now, perspective is not a blueprint. A perspective is a working hypothesis. We look at that. We follow events. We follow the processes. It's a guide to action. It's a guide to our orientation. No more than that, but a very important guide and explains in a very general way what is going to happen in the future. We are the memory of the working class, as Trotsky once explained. And it's the task of the party to resolve this problem. Because the greatest crisis and the greatest problem comes down to well, the greatest factor in history, in that sense, is the subjective factor, is the revolutionary party. Without the party, the working class will not succeed. History shows it. With a party, it can come to power, as the Russian Revolution explained. And our task is to, we're the only ones who understand that, are preparing for that eventuality. We must work to that view in mind. <coughs> Of course, uh, there will be times when the ruling class, if the trade union and labor leaders cannot hold the back the working class any longer, then it's quite clear the ruling class will look for other means to deal a lesson to the workers. And there is an authoritarian uh, means. And they've done that in the past. Of course, the problem they've got is the balance of forces in society is very much against them. In the 1970s, when there was a big wave of industrial action, there were murmurings in the general staff, Brigadier Kitson and so on, who were talking about the possibility of coup in Britain. You had the Mountbatten idea also earlier being raised. These people were, well, even against Corbyn, they raised the threat. It's a symptom of, what, of how they, they think. And they will be preparing for that kind of bloody action against the workers if they could get away with it. Because the reason why they didn't take that road in the 1970s, it would have meant civil war, and it was a civil war they would not guarantee to win. And therefore they will think a thousand times before going down that route. But that will be the drive in, drive in, in their consciousness. 
If the, if the working class is on the offensive and the, and the leaders cannot control them. Of course, this revolutionary perspective that I've outlined will be derided by our enemies. And all I can say is, well, let them scoff. Let them scoff at us. We understand that a small organization, and we are a small organization, we haven't got a big head. We know the reality, but we also know our history. That a small organization with the right ideas, with the right approach, and connect with the working class can grow very, very rapidly under those circumstances. And that's what we, our perspective is based upon, of building up a lever. Of a, of a force that can be, act as, a, as a, a, an attraction, a pole of attraction at a certain point down the road for the building of a mass party itself. But again, we know there's no shortcuts. There, there cannot be. There ha we have to understand it. it's hard work to build the party. But of course, it's well, well, well worth well, uh, work. It's, and it's open work. The potential is there. And, uh, and of course, we believe, although we are relatively small, there's no reason in the world why we cannot establish a party of 5,000 or 10,000 in the next period. There's no reason in the world. It's up to us and no one else because the potential is there. Of course, we are not going to rush ahead of ourselves. Our main task, as Lenin explained in 1970, is patiently explain. It's a political task patiently explain our ideas to the advanced workers, to the youth, and so on. But patiently explain doesn't mean passivity. It means audacity. It means tenacity in order to fight for ideas. As Trotsky explained, remember, you can have a, a, a revolutionary both wise and ignorant, but you cannot have a revolutionary who doesn't, who lacks devotion, who does not prepare to break down all obstacles in its path. And that's what we have to do. We have to build a party. We have to build an organization firmly bedded in Marxist theory. That is the fundamental bedrock, as was explained last night. We're still a CADA organization. What is a CADA? A CADA is a comrade who understands the fundamental ideas of Marxism, the perspectives, and can explain those ideas to workers. A, 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 a Kida is someone who's capable of taking independent initiative to build the party. It takes time and takes experience, but that's what you have to have. We have to train up a thousand or by ten thousand of these Kidas for a much larger party itself. And of course, um, we uh, have the idea. It's in the, the perspectives document that we can we can build a party of ten thousand. In fact, I think that our slogan of this Congress should be wanted 10,000 communists and we make an appeal to build the party itself in the next period. Trotsky actually raised that point in 1933 to the small group of Trotskyists at the time who, who, whose task was to get to 1,000. That was an uphill task. But the idea of 10,000, he said, was easy once you got to 1,000. The leap is much quicker and much easier, and therefore we must see it in that light. You know, as the Bible says, knock and it shall be opened unto you. <laughs> Seek and you shall find that the great contact work of the early Christians. <laughs> and clearly, and it's, well, as, as you said last night, there's never a great attack. You, most of the communists are very young, which is great. I wish I was a bit younger. No way. <laughs> but you have the enthusiasm. You have the spirit. You have the elan, which comes from the ideas of Marxism. You are the shock troops of the Revolutionary Party. You have the duty to carry out what is needed. Not what you like, but what we need to do. We're on the road. We know we will we come to this, and we've done a great deal. But it's only the beginning. It's only at the start of this particular road. Yes, we're in the Lenin year. Wonderful. We will learn about Lenin and his ideas and the Bolshevik Party. But then we have to put it into practice. 
And that's what we have to understand. Every single comrade needs to raise their level and appreciate the fact that we and we alone are the key to the victory of the working class in Britain. And if we do our job well, if we prepare to rise to the occasion, then we can lay the basis for the victory of the working class in Britain as part of the world revolution itself. I say go forth, comrades. <laughs>